Hey everyone, this is Sebastian from Design Drives, the podcast where we learn about why, how, and what designers and designers are driving forward. In this episode, I talk with Mark Abraham, product leader at ASOS in London, and also co-creator of Mind the Product, which is an international product conference. We actually met way back in 2018 at a UX conference in Istanbul. He's also the author of two books, his recent being Managing Products Equaling Managing Tensions. Um, there he is really discussing the act of balance that a product manager has to do in his role. Therefore, we also learn how he makes trade-offs between desirability, feasibility and viability and his key learnings in corporate design into product strategy and business strategy at large. Enjoy the episode. All right. Hi, Mark. Nice to meet you again. It's a, good to see you again. So, Mark, uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, for the interview. I think it would be amazing for the audience if you can just uh, set some context and give them a little bit about an introduction about yourself, what you have done in the past, how you became a product manager, and some of the things you have been involved in. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, for, first of all, for, for having me. Yeah, my, my career is, uh, has been a, an interesting one because I started my professional life as a corporate lawyer uh, back in the Netherlands, which is where I'm from. And I've been on this journey to become a product person, which I've been for the last nine or 10 years. And it's been a really interesting journey because I started life as a lawyer, did that for a few years, did an MBA here in the UK where I'm now based, realizing like, If I want to use anything that I learn in this MBA, I can't go back into law. Um, so the question is, what do you do next? I ended up still working in professional services. I worked for an accounting firm, but very much focused on marketing and business development. And without really thinking too much about it at the time, that gave me my first exposure to working on a software project, rolling out a big CRM system across, across this big accounting firm. And That then led me on to a bit of a hustle to, to get into digital because I thought, yeah, I, I don't want to stay in professional services. I want to work on digital projects and, and products. Did a lot of pro bono work for startups and more established companies. And then I got my first couple of jobs in digital as a project manager, mostly working for, for agencies on a wide range of products and, and projects. And again, I got to that re uh, realization about nine, ten years ago thinking, Project management is nice, but you know I felt the limitations of working on a project, particularly if you do it in an agency context um, where you focus on scope, budget, and time. And I thought, no, I want to be involved in products. And at the time, uh, particularly here in, in, in London, in the UK, where I'm based, product management was still a relatively novel thing. I would argue it still is, but definitely then. Um, but I started you know, learning more about product management. And again, I got my first break um, about 10 years ago, working in a medium sized kind of music company focused on, on streaming, digital music. And I've done a wide variety of roles in products since uh, starting very much as a product person embedded in a cross-functional team, working with designers and engineers to my current role, where I am one of the heads of product at ASOS, which is a, a global fashion retail company that listeners might have heard of. And within that, I focus very much with my team of product managers and product designers on engaging customers. So we look at things like messaging on site, mes messaging customers off site, CRM activity, how do you customers back in the fold? How do you target the right messages and promotions at customers? That's, that's really my focus on a day to day basis at ASOS. Yeah, super uh, nice. Thanks for the great overview. So what is your, when you think about your role as a product manager, what is your personal drive on a day-to-day -day basis? Really what kind of, you know, motivates you as a, a product manager? Yeah, I think, I think the key thing is, is, is solving customer problems. That's what got me into product in the first place. And that's what I still get excitement from, even in my, in my current role, which obviously has evolved a, little, a bit more because I'm now more of a manager of other product managers, if you like, on a day-to-day -day basis. But really looking at where the customer pain points, where the customer problems, how can we best solve those? And ideally do that iteratively. So you, you want to learn early and often about A, what those customer needs are and how you can best solve those customer needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally makes sense. 
So, you know, that design drives is also a lot about design, right? And about um, the role of designers. You actually uh, collaborating uh, a lot with designers. We actually met at a UX design conference uh, back in Istanbul uh, two <laughs> years ago. So what's your personal engagement with designers in your role and how do you work with designers? Yeah, so so it's interesting. So <clears throat> at, at ASOS, we've, we've gotten to a situation fairly recently where designers and, 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 and product owners at ASOS have merged into one, one family, basically, whereas before mm -hmm. we had a centralized product function, a centralized UX uh, function, and the two have now been kind of merged together. And, 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 and to be honest with you, that's how I've always worked with designers, where we collaborate, you know, early and often on a particular product, on a particular feature, and particularly product people and designers, you know, in my experience, they should be joined at the hip, particularly at the, at the, the discovery phase where you're trying to figure out uh, what the problem is that you're trying to solve, which customers are affected by that problem what the impact is of, of that problem in their day-to-day -day lives or any tasks that they want to complete. And what we're doing now at ASOS is really bringing that together a bit more where when we talk about discovery, A, for instance, I want that to be a continuous activity, not something that you do at the start of a project that work on, on something for nine months and then say, did it work? No, you do it early and often. But I also want product people very closely involved in the customer research. Whereas in some companies, you know, that typically gets done by a UX designer or a UX researcher. Um, and, and again, I'm sure that works for some companies, but in my experience, you get so much more value and alignment if, like I said, if, if the designer and a product person do that in unison and are joined at the hip. Uh, when they when they discover problems and they learn from customers and about customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah, super interesting. I also agree that uh, there's a lot of value if that's being done together because I think then the product people also have a way better understanding uh, of the consumer needs or like why of this some of the things are reported. Um, how is your process looking in general? You're already mentioning one phase that you are very involved uh, in when it comes also to collaboration with designers, the discovery phase. But how is your process looking in general, your product manager process or product yeah, I process? Think, yeah, I, I, th I think the, 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 the key part of that, that process is, again, I have to, I'm going to sound like a broken record before you know it, but it starts with the problem. And one of the key aspects of that process is really understand the problem setting a vision for what solving that problem looks like and again this is even before you start thinking especially if you're working on a on a new product or a feature it's slightly different if you work on an existing product that's been around for uh for a good few years or a feature um because then you focus much more on what can we improve how have the needs evolved of our customers but let's start very simply with, 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 with something new that you're working on, it really comes down to what's, what's the problem that we're trying to solve, which customers are affected by this problem. And from a process point of view, one of the key things I want people to, you know, and I always look at is what assumptions are we making about that product, uh, that problem that we're solving? What assumptions are we making about the customer? What assumptions are we making about the impact of the problem for the customer and the impact of our potential solution that we're going to come up with? And if you talk about process, a lot of the stages, not just in the discovery stage, but even when you're building are around those kind of validating those, those assumptions and hypotheses. I can imagine that quite a lot of your listeners are familiar with the idea of lean UX, where you constantly, you know, you start with identifying what is my problem space, what assumptions are we making as a business or as an individual, how can I test those? And I always want to work where we pick off the, the riskiest assumptions. So that process is always geared towards that, that you've got, um, it's, it's like two tracks, really. You've got um, engineers typically working on something that we've tested or we're confident about and we've clarified what we're what we're trying to do but at the same time again going back to what i said earlier you've got a designer and a product 
person typically looking at the next assumption uh, to tackle, the next problem to solve. Uh, and, and the process, if you want to call it that, is very much geared towards those dual tracks uh, that are running in parallel. Yeah, totally makes sense. So do you have any, you already mentioned engineering, do you have any best practices on basically uh, balancing like engineering kind of facility, uh, basically engineering needs, the kind of product and economic needs, basically out of that product and the design and uh, user experience um, aspects? Yes. Well, uh, I think two, two things that I typically do. The first thing is, is obviously involving engineers again, early and often. Uh, I've made the mistake earlier on in my career where you go down a certain route of discovering a, a feature or solution, testing with customers. Everyone is very excited. And then you talk to the engineers about implementing that solution and they go, uh, Mark, what were you thinking? That's technically not viable or going to take us a crazy yeah. amount of time. So as early as we can, you know, in an ideal situation, I've, and I've been fortunate enough to be in that situation where you get <clears throat> engineers being part of that discovery, listening to customers. So that's one thing. I think when, when you ask me about those trade-offs and those technical considerations, I always try to bring it back to the customer. Because what I don't want is a situation where we're doing things because they make sense for us internally, or they make sense from a technical implementation point of view, but they're you know, going to have such an impact on the customer that they're not going to use the product or feature, they're not going to buy it. So that's, you know, I can't give you hard and fast rules because every time you'll have to, you know, that's, that's part of being a product person, make those trade-off decisions. But for me, the, the, you know, solving the customer problem and achieving a specific outcome for the customer and which then also serves business objectives. If you get it right, that's always leading. Doesn't mean that you just ignore everything else, but I, I, my role as a product person is to make sure we don't lose sight of that. But at the same time, consider like, okay, are there any kind of technical compromises we need to make? Is there anything we need to? take into account from a technical perspective in terms of scope. That's all cool. That's what we do. We do the same from a design perspective. Again, our role as a product person is we're almost like that person in the middle who's trying to bring all those different considerations together. But for me personally, the, the customer problem and the customer experience is always the overarching driver, if you like. Mm -hmm. Well, something to mention here is that you also wrote a book. So the book is called Managing Tensions. So um, basically, how do you, um, is that basically what you were mentioning when you're kind of uh, talking about balancing kind of the different stakeholders and needs when, when you talk about tension? Absolutely, because it's, uh, you're 100% right. It's one of the, 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 the tensions that I talk about in my book, which, which is about, I've got a customer need, I've got a technology right? Or I've got a product or I've got a platform. There is going to be constraints. You know, a customer might want X or might have problem Y, but I can only do A because of the, the, the infrastructure that we've got or the technology that we've got. I talk in a book about, you know, knitting spaghetti where, <laughs> you know, if you think about creative problem solving, you can go all over the place. But typically, you know, if you think about a digital product or even a physical product mm -hmm. you know there, there there are there are constraints right if you building cars let's say you know there's 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 a certain you know there's a ceiling to what you can do and it's the same with with software right you have going to have constraints especially if you work on a on a, on a product or uh, that's that's more mature and and it, like i said a large part of what we do as product people is always balance those different constraints and make trade-off decisions. Now, there's lots of ways of, of doing that, because again, one of the things that I um, often do, which helps that, that, that trade-off decision is really to say, what's the minimum level of customer experience that we don't want to go un under, basically? So what I don't want is, for instance, when people talk about minimum viable products and I think that they can just create a really <laughs> crappy experience and think, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. You'd say, no, that I'm not going to cross that line. And it's the same for technology, right? 
there's a, there's a whole, and I talk about this in the book, there's obviously a big spectrum between gold plating, the best software the world has ever seen and the most scalable and robust uh, to something which is not going to stack up at all. And you want to end up somewhere in the middle. And again, the product person doesn't even necessarily make uh, the decisions always. It can be a joint decision or an expert who makes the decision, but at least will try to unearth uh, some of those trade-offs and some of those tensions. Uh, and that's what I write about in the book. Mm, super interesting. Um, so the book just came out. I think it's available on Amazon. We're going to put the link also into the description. Right. Is there, um, if you could maybe outline another learning that you really would like that, you know, people kind of learn from the book besides uh, what you have just mentioned? Yeah, I think, uh, and I guess that also ties in with why I started writing this book, Managing Product Equals Managing Tension, because I I felt that we've had lots of great books uh, for, for product managers and designers about some of the tactics and some of the you know, air quotes, hard skills of, of, of developing products and managing products. Uh, whilst I find that a lot of, uh, man, you know, the, the problems and the challenges, but also the opportunities involved in, in, in product management are down to people and down to managing these tensions. And, and it's interesting, I don't know about your experiences, Sebastian, but I often hear about those challenges, but mostly around, you know, in a, around the water cooler kind of private moments with other product people they say product management is hard and they don't necessarily then talk about oh it's so hard to create a roadmap no they talk about it's hard to make these tough decisions it's hard to deal with difficult stakeholders so that prompted me uh <laughs> to write the book and to to really zero in on that and the, the the key thing i i would love people to take away from reading that book is is building in the time to think about how do i manage those kind of again air quotes softer skills how do i reflect on tensions do i walk away from them from them do i ignore them do i embrace them uh, the key point that i'm making in the book is that tension doesn't have to be a bad thing you know our our primary reaction is to think you know tension that must be a bad thing that must mean conflict that must be difficulty um, but actually, if you're thinking about solving problems and solving problems creatively and innovating, you know, tension is actually healthy. Uh, but what I'm trying to do through the book is to say, well, how can we feel comfortable with tension? How can we embrace it in a, in a healthy way and making sure it doesn't become unhealthy or unsustainable? And what I do in the book is talk about that process and that mindset, but also give people a lot of practical tools of, of how you can put that into practice. Yeah, super interesting. You could say basically in the tension, there's the innovation, right? <laughs> so if you exactly. manage the tension well, uh, that's actually an opportunity to come up with something innovative because you maybe find a different approach how to deal with these tensions, right? Um, super interesting. I also really um, like that you talked, you briefly touched on MVP. <laughs> and there's a lot of discussion <laughs> yeah. going on on MVP versus, you know, other things like, and maybe that depends maybe on kind of the industry um, that you are in uh, potentially. But as for example, also one discussion like is MVP um, always the right thing or is it maybe an MDP, minimal desirable product, for example? Yeah. What's 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 your take on that? Yeah, I think the, the reason why I, I mentioned MVP and I'm always a bit careful when I talk about MVP because... I don't know about you, but I have seen so many examples and people I've spoken to where you find out that, you know, the idea of an MVP is being abused for either just creating something really crap and thinking, yeah, that's an MVP or that people talk about, we've got a massive project or, uh, but we're only going to do a small part of it. And then, you know, that's our MVP. Whereas I treat an, a, a, a minimum viable product more as a, you know, a learning opportunity that you can then iterate on. What that means in my mind is that, again, going back to your question earlier about process, is you use the, the, the MVP as a way to pick off your riskiest assumptions about the customer, about whether customers want it, whether we're going to make money from it. And you start working through that. To get those learnings, you need to create a product or an experience that is valuable to the customer, to the business. Because again, if you create something bad, um, 
or something that you're not going to iterate on, you know, you're not like you're likely to create a, an experience that isn't isn't great and is not, you know, more importantly, isn't going to give you those learnings. So the times I've worked most successfully, for instance, with designers is where we really worked on starting something new, but doing it in an iterative fashion and really working both discovering some of those assumptions, but also working through those assumptions quite methodically in terms of the product that we were building. So I remember, for instance, I worked at a marketplace a good few years ago on a, on a data dashboard for the sellers on the marketplace. And it's interesting because as soon as you start doing that, uh, you can imagine people say, I want this whole wish list of things. And people internally say, well, we need to get this massive big uh, product off the shelf somewhere. And I worked with a really good designer. What we did together was take all those, really understand uh, the, the wish list. Uh, in terms of what data people wanted to see and how they wanted to interact with the dashboard. But taking a step back and saying, why do people want a dashboard? Why do people even need the data, right? And understanding some of the assumptions that we'd made about, well, we think people want the data so they can really plan their stock levels in time for Christmas, for instance. How do you know how people? How do you know that people use a dashboard or whatever you come, up, you know, solution you come up with, uh, whether they'll use it for that reason? So that's a very different approach in my mind to saying, okay, we've got a list of requirements. We're going to spend nine months create this massive dashboard, you know, and then we're going to do a big ta-da moment and we release it. Whereas what we did was, no, we know what the risky assumptions are. First of all, would people even use a dashboard? So we're going to create the first iteration of that with a number of key, what we think are key data points, still usable as a product, great experience, simple. And then depending on whether people use it and whether we learn, whether they find it helpful, the data that we've shared, we're going to build on that. So instead of spending nine months, in this case, we spent one month, uh, we got the learnings which then fed into the next iteration, which took another month. But again, that comes back to what I said earlier about learning early and often. And, and I think, you know, my experience, engineers, but definitely designers play a key part in that, that process. Totally makes sense, right? You, you try to figure out, okay, what are the most risky assumptions that you have? Or what are the kind of key hypotheses that you need to evaluate if this product is actually, you know, cash flow positive or, you know, kind of generates and matches with a need? Do you have any learnings on how do you evaluate business hypotheses in terms of when it comes to a new product? Yeah, we can talk about the tactics in, in a minute. But I think the key thing is, like you're pointing out, is asking the question with, with those assumptions is and hypotheses that we have about the customer, about whether people buy it, is how confident do we need to be? Because yeah. what you don't want to do is to say, oh, I'm going to, let's say, test something for two years before we then, you know, launch it to the bigger market. Exactly. Yeah. You, you might want to do that, but it's not a luxury that you have whether you're a startup or an established company. So that, that is a key question. Like, how confident do we want to be? Obviously, if you work in a more established company, my experience, sometimes the confidence level needs to be a bit higher. Uh, and you might say, right, for that reason alone, we're going to do a big beta program with a substantial number of users uh, so that when we do fully go to market with our product to, to everyone, let's say, we've got a good, you know, stable kind of, you know, uh, basis uh, in terms of our learnings, in terms of our insights, or we do a really big A-B test before we do anything else to get that level of confidence. Whereas if you work at a startup and you don't, you don't really have, you have, you know, a large user base, you might say, we're going to do a smoke and mirrors test, do a paint a door, you don't build the functionality, but you give people a hint of what the product is or what the proposition is. And you say, that gives me enough confidence to go to the next step of developing this product. And that's, and we're, and we're good with that. But do you see what I mean? I always try to bring it back to what do you want to learn? How risky is the assumption and how confident do you need to be? about the, the assumption and the, and the related hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Do you have any uh, maybe project in the past that where you really gaining a lot of value out of a collaboration with designers or any kind of favorite project 
where the collaboration with designers or like design stakers or really lead to a, like a larger impact when it came to the product? Yeah, I think, you know, I refer back to that example I gave earlier about where we worked on this marketplace product, because that for me was a really good example. And I've had similar kind of projects and, and pieces where I worked in a, in a similar fashion with, mm -hmm. with designers, but this is a really good one where the pro, you know, me as a product manager worked so closely with the designer. We had the shared understanding of the customers. Again, it wasn't, oh, the designer talks to customers and the product manager works, talks to the engineers, or it's the product manager who talks to the, the customers, gets the learnings and asks the designer to come up with some wireframes. It was very, I would almost use the word symbiotic, where together we visited the sellers really observed them to understand how they were working currently, um, then probed and talked to those sellers on the platform, like, why are you doing certain things this way? Why do you need this data? How do you use it? Give examples. But then also being in a position to really then convey that and, and to the engineers uh, and our stakeholders say, this is what we learned and tell a story about that. That's what I enjoy the most is where it's beyond just, oh, we're creating a lovely design or we're thinking about experience, but being able to connect the dots in terms of the story of why we're doing this, who we're doing this for, the impact that we're going after and taking people together with the designer, taking people on that journey with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit about your role, current role at ASOS and uh, what maybe you're really excited about when you look at some of the upcoming things uh, and maybe also some of the challenges that you see specifically uh, in the fashion sector that you are basically uh, in when it comes to digital products? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of things I'm excited about in, in this space because I still think there's, you know, an, an awful lot of good things that we, we can do there um, in terms of how we create experiences about, you know, around products, uh, but not only fashion products, thinking face and body products, um, yeah. thinking sportswear. So, so that, that excites me looking at ways of how do we position those, those products and experiences? Cause you know, if you think about buying a face and body product, like, um, let's say a hair product, uh, not something I can speak to personally cause I've lost most of it, but you know, <laughs> buying a hair product or buying a face product, um, is a very different experience from a customer's perspective to buying a dress or a pair of trousers. So really optimizing the experience. I think the other thing is that I feel there's a, a lot of scope still within not just the ASOS, but other e-commerce players around personalization. And I know that's just, you know, maybe a bit of a, a buzzword, but if you, if you think about, I, I come from, from, from music and content where I used to work previously in that space and Obviously, they've got a bit of a head start in terms of understanding customer needs and tailoring the experience. If you think about Spotify, Netflix, and I think with with e-commerce, there's a lot of opportunity to to do more of that to really understand specific customer needs, having dedicated experiences to dedicated customers. Um, so that's what's exciting. I think what we're also seeing is much more of a shift towards kind of sustainable fashion. Vintage is another key one. If you think about a product or platform like ASOS Marketplace, where we enable boutiques to sell on that platform. Um, but also if you think about people wanting to maybe sell to, to other people, right? If you, they've, they've bought something, they've worn it a few times, it's still in good condition, rather than throwing it away, they'll want to sell it to someone else. So I think we'll see a lot more of that, 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 that thinking about sustainability and the experience around that over the coming years. I think in terms of uh, challenges, I think, you know, one of the things that we always think about uh, at ASOS and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and I encourage my, my product managers and designers to think about is how do we differentiate? Because it's very easy to, you know, think, oh, ASOS and you've got Zalando and you've got Sheen, got a lot of these great kind of fashion e-commerce brands. But what makes ASOS special is that the experience, is that the product, is that the mix? Again, we're aiming for a great mix of 
physical products that we offer, but also the best experience around it. But that's obviously that in my mind, that differentiation is, is, is a key. I wouldn't even call it a challenge, but definitely an opportunity to, to always think about this. Like, how can we be different and how can we stay relevant to our customers and target customers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Makes sense. Um, yeah, a lot of exciting things that you mentioned around personalization, sustainability. I'm also wondering how COVID maybe changed for you sort of requirements when it comes to users or your general product managing, uh, product manager process or any kind of new influences that came through that. No, it's, you know, it's, it's a good question. I'm, I have to be honest with you. I'm still li living, living through it. Like I'm sure you and your listeners are and, and trying to, to figure out as we go. I definitely see that. Not just ASOS, because ASOS is is an online platform and it always has been. But it's interesting to see other companies now doubling down on 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 digital and having uh, and their online presence, which again forces anyone to just step up their game in terms of being uh, being strong online and having that digital presence. But you could say that's that was a trend that was already underway, uh, so that's nothing new. But yeah. From what I can see so far, that COVID definitely seems to have accelerated that trend where people are much more comfortable with buying online, discovering online. In terms of processes, I don't necessarily think that the, the processes and the way of working has changed that much. But it does, you know, working remotely means that you have to work a bit harder. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a bad thing, but even if you think about the role of a product manager, and, and I guess it's the same for, for designers, product designers, or UX designers, is working with a wide range of, of stakeholders, be that customers, be that internal colleagues that we work with across functions. And a lot of what we do, like I said before, is taking those people on a journey, whether it's discovering, implementing a particular, discovering a problem to solve, implementing a solution, and obviously, I personally, I don't know about you, Sebastian, but I find that much harder to do in, uh, through Zoom at times than, than I would in person when it's much easier to say, well, let's talk to a customer together or do a workshop together to figure this out. So like I said, we've definitely learned over the last couple of months to do that uh, more effectively virtually, um, building on what we used to do in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely can uh, agree and can understand the points that you were raising. Talking a little bit broader around the product and maybe success factors for uh, products. Why do you think or what do you see from the outside? I mean, you see a lot of product, product managers doing their work. You see a lot of digital products and a lot of, you do a lot of mentoring. What are you, what, what do you think are key reasons why products and very often then it's the whole company actually, in fact. Uh, uh, don't make it and, and fail? Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a good question. I think there's plenty of examples, and I've seen it myself, where one of the key reasons uh, that companies or particular products fail or don't become the su success that we, we thought that they would become is because we lose sight of the customer. So that's, and again, it, sometimes it happens with the best of intentions, because the company is under pressure to generate revenue or make money or be more efficient about cost. But again, it has a bearing on, on the customer, on the customer experience, on the product. Equally, there's lots of examples of products that were even brought into this world without <laughs> seemingly not having really done any research about the customer. So you could ask like, okay, why do we have this product? I'm not sure what customer needs it solving. So. For me, that, that's a key reason why companies and products fail. I've equally seen with more established products where it's almost like a case of what they, I think they call it Conway's law, where the product or the, the service is a reflection of everything that's going on within the organization and the organizational structure. So it's almost like a bit of a Frankenstein product or experience, right? Where you can tell there's lots of different departments within a big company all wanted to have their you know, feature or their need in that product. And I don't care as a customer about what's happening in, in, in that company, right? So again, that, that's another thing I've seen failing. And 
the the third reason why I believe certain products or companies fail is is, is complacency. Uh, where companies are, we all know the the good examples of the Codex and the blockbusters of this world, but it's a real thing where you go into companies and they're doing well, um, and they don't necessarily think about iterating or they're not really on top of new trends or what competitors are doing. And again, I'm not saying that you should be completely obsessed with what your competitor does and, you know, copy them blindly. But just, again, it comes back to being in touch with what's happening around you and not just being so inert, just looking at what you think is a great product or a great solution and just lose sight of what's happening around you. And again, I think we all know examples of companies that fail to do that over the years and, you know, are no longer in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the aspect of trends, uh, consumer trends, as another point where you know a lot of companies lose uh, lose sight and kind of don't make it, or the product doesn't make it. Um, there's also a lot of designers uh, in the design community are maybe interested in product managers. There's also you, um, I've seen this myself with with colleagues who are more coming from the design background, then transitioned at some point, for example, a more product role. Uh, what would be your advice for designers who are interested in making such a shift? Yeah, I think there's, there's uh, I've seen those examples myself, and those, those designers that I've worked with or come across who've made that transition, what they've, the common theme that I've seen with those is that they've went beyond the design. So they were already... You know, doing a lot of great stuff in terms of engaging with customers, understanding customer problems. But in addition to that, to break into product management, where, as I said before, it's you're, it's slightly broader because you're that person in the middle between um, the, the customer and customer experience, the implementation side of things and the commercial, the business side of things. So what Designers that, that want to make that transition, the ones that I've seen doing that have looked at, you know, they've become much more involved in the strategy for one. So that meant that whilst they were working on a specific project, they also really start thinking about, okay, what's, what, what are the next steps for, for this particular product uh, or for this customer problem or this vision that we're trying to achieve? So strategy is definitely a key part to, to at least have a good grasp of of how you go about that, how do you bring that back to day-to-day -day working with engineers and, and designers and customers and stakeholders. Other point is data. Um, again, the, 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 those designers that I've seen making that transition to product management are the ones that are really curious about customer data, industry data, understanding also why we're doing something or not doing something, how that's infect, affecting certain key metrics. So again, what they're, what they're effectively do is, you know, you build up that, that broader picture beyond just, and I say just, but beyond designing a, a, an experience for the customer. Yeah, makes sense. One thing what that really differs to designer and then also to the, um, what the product person is as a product person, you need to, you need to think about engineering as well. You need to think, uh, Like about tension, like you were saying, you also yeah. need to think about uh, the economic factors. How should um, designers that are interested in, in product kind of approach these topics? Uh, because there are certain tools that you need to learn also on how to evaluate or balance these things, right? Yeah. And, and it's a really good point. But for me, it ultimately, and I, I'd say the same to, to, to product managers, it starts with asking the right questions. Questions of the data, questions about the product, questions about the commercials, to your point. So, for instance, if I'm a designer or even a product manager and I want to really understand where the problem I've just discovered or this product that's, that I'm working on fits in um, from a commercial perspective, I'll look at things like what are the unit economics of this product, right? What does it cost to make it? What does it cost to acquire the the customer, uh, you look at things like in lots of e-commerce transactions, you look at sales margins. Again, just having that understanding is so critical for a product person because what it does is it enables you to understand all these different pieces. Like, is it worth making this if we're selling it for five pounds and it takes us seven pounds to make it from a technology point of view or the cost of the goods sold? But 
had, you know, that's, that's where I start. And again, you don't have to, I'm not saying that if you're a designer or product person, you suddenly have to become a finance expert. Uh, but you'll see just asking those questions. And I do the same. You know, I go to people in our finance team and say, can you tell me how, 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 how we, how we make money of transactions, what the different components are and what the levers are to be smarter about it or, and, 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 and that's it. And then you've got really good people who dream about that stuff and we'll break that down for you. But that's how you start learning. And then you can yeah, yeah. make your own decisions and, 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 and do further research. But for me, again, a lot of, you know, that transition or that, what I call that product mindset begins and ends with curiosity and asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally makes sense. I, I really like that you mentioned finance stakeholders, but also marketing, right? Is another big overlap to pro as a product person. You think about consumer acquisition costs uh, or user acquisition costs and all of these different things. And uh, like you said, managing tension, right? Do you, as a last question, do you have any final advice for designers from your kind of more product management roles for designers who want to create digital products? First thing is stay curious. And I know that sounds obvious, but it's so important if you want to create great digital products um, and, and build on those great digital products. It's so important to always question yourself, question your assumptions, question the people that you work with, question your own thoughts, because um, that's how you innovate. That's how you, how you, or you iterate on products that might not be so successful, actually might be super successful. But if you want to continue that success, you have to have that, you know, really nur nurture that curiosity. And the, the other final thing is I really believe in, you know, doing right by the customer and solving customer problems equals customer uh, equals business success. And, and sometimes, you know, there's a risk of purely focusing on, on, on business objectives. And again, I'm not saying that's wrong thing because that's the reality, right? We need to make money. We need to think about that. But we have to make sure whether we're product designers or product managers, that we don't forget about customer value, customer benefit, and we find, you know, find the right balance. Because if you don't, that, that will really have a negative impact on, 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 on the product or service that you're working on. All right, that was the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, it would really mean a lot to me if you would give it a positive review because it makes other people also discover the content. It would also mean a lot to me if you liked the episode and would share with someone else who would also benefit from the content and episode. And I would be super interested to hear about your biggest takeaway and learning from the episode. Just let me know via social media. I'm super interested to hear what you think. And I hope you have a good day. Bye.